I got a list. You could, you could take apart this list and come up with an explanation that does not directly reference space for everything on this list. You could probably do that. But I take a step back and I look at that list and I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, how is it? Let's back up to 1962 briefly. Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring. The Green Movement typically credits that as the birth of, uh, birth of ecology, the birth of caring about the environment. It was a best-selling book. I have a different view. Maybe it planted some seeds, maybe it tilled the landscape. But stuff didn't really start happening until after that photo of Earthrise Over the Moon was published. 1968, the whole Earth catalog is published. There's a version before that photo is printed. The instant that photo comes out, that is the identifying cover picture of the whole Earth catalog. Thinking about Earth as a whole, not as a place where nations war, as a whole. Seven months later, 1969, we land on the moon. 1970, we're still going to the moon. We go until 1972, so watch this sequence of events. 1970, the Comprehensive Clean Air Act is passed. There were two other versions of that in the 60s, 1963 and 67, but the most important rendering of that act came in 1970. Earth Day was birthed March 1970. The Environmental Protection Agency was founded in 1970. There was a film called The Hellstrom Chronicle. It was one of the first documentary, pseudo documentaries to actually get first run in the theaters. It was all about insects, kind of, it was a scare movie about insects and what role they might play on our food supply as we go forward. But it got us thinking about nature. The organization Doctors Without Borders was founded in 1971. Where do you even get that phrase from? No one thought of that phrase before that photo was published. Because every globe in your classroom has countries painted on it. Doctors Without Borders, 1971. DDT gets banned, not right after Rachel Carson's book, gets banned in 1972. We're still going to the moon. We're still looking back to Earth. Clean Water Act, 1971, 1972, Endangered Species Act. Two versions of that in the 1960s. The, the most comprehensive version, 1973. The catalytic converter gets put in in 1973. Unleaded gas, 1973. We're still at war in Vietnam. There's still campus unrest. Yet we found the time to start thinking about Earth. That is space operating on our culture, and you cannot even put a price on that. That is, that is a nation, that is a world reacting to a new perspective on what it is to be alive on this planet that we all share. And out of that era, an entire generation of people, they think, they feel, they intellectualize about space. We see it in the art, we see it in Hollywood, we see it in television productions, storytellers. That's because the space frontier was crossed weekly. You know, back then, you didn't need special programs to convince people that science was a good thing in school. You didn't need special programs to show people that engineering and math, the STEM fields, that these are useful to society, to our identity as a nation, because the headlines that were writ large over that era had built into them the fact that innovation created those headlines. Innovation brought to you by an ambitious community of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. 
So what happens? Mid-1970s come. It all ends. By the way, I have a collection of magazines. Look. Life. Time. Even Collier's going back into the 1950s. They all talked about tomorrow. How many, how many issues did you have to wait to before there was an article about the city of tomorrow, the home of tomorrow, transportation of tomorrow? It was in our culture, it was in our mindset, it was in our zeitgeist. 1970s come around. That all ended. The space frontier stopped being breached. We did other things. By the way, there was an engineering frontier that we took on. How do you make a reusable spacecraft? How do you build something in zero G, something big, like a space station? All this comes in the next 10 to 20 years. That's advancing an engineering frontier. It's not advancing a space frontier. And if I may put some of this in perspective, remember that schoolroom globe I was telling you about? Take Earth, shrink it to a schoolroom gro school globe, and ask, how far away is Mars? on that scale. It's a mile away. How far away is the moon? 30 feet away. Most people get that distance wrong because in textbooks they have to fit the moon on the same page as the earth. So you think moon is much closer than it actually is. We've been lied to over all those years. If you drew earth as a natural three inch size circle on a textbook page, the moon would have to be several pages back from that. You need a fold out to check it out. <laughs> Mars is a mile away, the moon 30 feet away. The International Space Station Space Shuttle orbiting Earth three-eighths of an inch above its surface. That's not advancing a space frontier. Some other kind of frontier, not space frontier, I assert. By the way, the thickness of Earth's atmosphere on that scale, it's the thickness of the lacquer on the globe. That's how thin this air is that we breathe, that we think of as an ocean of air. It is as thin to the earth as the skin of an apple is to an apple, as the lacquer is to a schoolroom globe. So you got to love the space entrepreneurs who are taking tourists up above the atmosphere but we're kind of telling them that that's space. And I, I look at Earth and I come to it as an astrophysicist and I see the rest of the cosmos and I say, you got some more work to do on that one. Okay, keep at it, guys. I get just a couple notes. I'm almost done here. Sorry, taking so long. Plus, if, if we have time for q and I'd love to hear what's coursing in your minds, especially this audience. All right, so what are the current problems here in America, not other parts of the world? Here in America, what are, our economy is in the toilet. Hardly anybody's interested in the STEM fields. Our jobs are going overseas, and you have politicians that are pretty sure they have a solution to that. Oh, you need more science kids in the school? Let's make better science teachers. Well, there's a Band-Aid for you. Put that right there. Throw a couple of dollars on that one. That ought to fix that. How about our jobs going overseas? Okay, let me think about that. All right, how about put in some tariffs and make some tax incentives in the community? We'll keep the factory right there. Another Band-Aid. People aren't innovating. So we have to, so we put money in sort of innovation Businesses, okay. These are all Band-Aids, people. They're Band-Aids. Here's what we got to do. And I've said this a billion times. You double NASA's budget. Right now it's a half a penny on a dollar. Half a penny. That pays for everything. Space station, space, you know, every, this astro, all, the, all the centers, the Hubble telescope, the James Webb, the, the, the rover, the, the Kepler, everybody is out of that half a penny. You double it. Double it to a penny. 
That's all I'm going to say. Double it. And here's what you do. I'm a little unorthodox in this vision statement. I'm not going to twist people's arms. Let me just put it out there. I don't want to be driven by one destination or another. I don't want to say, our next thing we're going to do in space, we're going to go to Mars. It's like, excuse me, how about all the rest of space? You know what I want to do when you double the budget? Let's create a suite of launch vehicles. We're kind of sort of doing that now, but let's do that as the focus. A suite of launch vehicles with strap-ons, whatever you need, one configuration will get you to the moon. Another will get you to a Lagrangian point. Another will get you to Mars. Another will get you to the Earth, um, Earth-Sun L, uh, uh, L2, another Lagrangian point. Maybe there's an asteroid headed our way. We want to do something about that. We got another special configuration of rockets that'll get us there. So we create a suite of vehicles that gives us access to space. When Eisenhower came back from Europe after he saw the Autobahn and how it, 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 it survived he heavy climactic variation and troop man maneuvers, he said, I want some of those in my country. All right, so he gets everyone to agree to build the interstate system. Did he say, you know, I just want to build it from New York to LA? because that's where you should go. No, the, no, the interstate system connects everybody in whatever way you want. That's how you grow a system. And I'm not gonna discriminate. If there's a military reason to do something on the moon, we got the launch vehicles to do it. If there's a tourist reason to go to the backside of the moon, we'll, that's another configuration. You wanna mine the moon, we, that's another one. Scientists want to study, see if there's life on Mars? We'll do that too. Everybody's space interest gets served by this capacity. And when you do this, you guarantee that you are advancing a space frontier every week. And you, I can guarantee you every week there's going to be a new headline. Astronauts, engineers found a way to extract the water from the soils of Mars, separate the hydrogen and oxygen. We now have a supply of rocket fuel on Mars, a fill-in station, so you don't have to carry all your fuel with you. We've, we're mining helium-3 on the lunar surface. I don't know if it's cheap enough to bring it back here to Earth, set up some other nuclear reactor somewhere else in space. Whatever are the needs or urges, be they geopolitical, military, economic, space becomes that frontier, and you know you know every week some new invention is going to be uh, granted. Some new patent is going to be offered. Because space is hard, space is dangerous, space is exciting. Not only do you innovate, these innovations make headlines, and those headlines work their way down the educational pipeline. And everybody in school knows about it. You don't have to set up a program to convince people that being an engineer is cool. They'll know it just by the cultural presence of those activities. You do that, it'll jumpstart our dreams. That's what it'll do. And you know innovation drives economies. It's especially been true since the Industrial Revolution. You double NASA's budget. It's not a handout. That's what it is today. That's what everyone thinks it is. It's a handout for special interest. You know what Mitt Romney got wrong when he criticized Newt Gingrich for pandering to Florida, the Florida constituency, by saying he'll do all these nice things for NASA? Romney said, you're just pandering to, to, to Florida. If you go to, you go to New Hampshire, you'll tell them something else about some bridge that they want. There's a deep misunderstanding there. The very statement that talking about NASA is pandering omits, omits the fact that NASA drives our economy. The, the culture of NASA drives the culture of innovation, and it's the culture of innovation that drives the economies of the 21st century. That's what it's missing. Even if there's pork spending on NASA, even if there's pork, what comes out of that spending benefits the nation in ways that a power plant or a bridge or a local road does not. I'm just, I can be honest about that. Even if some of you can't, because you're in it, you're too close, you got 
I can say it, and I'm saying it. And you know what happens? The jobs do not go overseas. You don't have to set up tax benefits. They don't go overseas because we're innovating and they haven't figured out how to do it yet. It has to stay here in America. And you have to keep innovating. They'll eventually catch up, fine, hand it to them. You can't simultaneously assert that we are a global economy and then cry foul if a corporation takes a plant overseas where the labor's cheaper. That's kind of part of how that works. So the solution is not trying to just prevent that with laws. You innovate so that it doesn't happen in the first place. Teacher training, we need that. It is a necessary but insufficient condition to make this happen. You can have an awesome teacher in middle school, high school. Now you want to become a scientist. You come out the other end of that educational pipeline, what do you do? We lost an entire generation of these smart people. They became like investment bankers or lawyers out of the 1980s and 90s because there's no place for them to take their interest in science. You have big, bold, ambitious projects, you get them all. Especially since the NASA science portfolio involves biologists. We're looking for life. It's got chemists, geologists, astrophysicists, physicists. The NASA portfolio touches all of these. Not only that, we need the electrical engineers, the mechanical engineers, the structural engineers. NASA is a one agency showdown. If we have an innovation culture, we'll resurrect some of that attitude we all had in the 1960s. Except this time it'll be without the tandem expense of war that was conducted. By the way, if China wants to put military bases on Mars, we're on Mars in 10 months. You know that, okay? <laughs> they just have to leak that memo. It doesn't even have to be true. We'll take one month to fund, design, and build the craft in nine months to get to Mars. We'll be on Mars in 10 months. We already understand our resolve when we feel threatened. That aspect will remain. That capacity to react will remain. The difference is we need to look at NASA not as a handout, but as an investment. Because I can tell you that as the health, as goes the health of Spacefaring ambitions, so too goes the spiritual, the emotional, the intellectual, the creative. And the economic ambitions of a nation, so goes the future of America. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. That was great. But you collected some. We got some questions. Got for some you. questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, to your point about doubling NASA's budget. Just, just a penny. It's a nice round number. I could have said, you know, double it by. You know, I could have said up it by, you know, eighty-nine percent. I mean, it's a round number. Sure. But it's a very clean round number, and it takes it just to a penny. And Penny so we, on the tax dollar, yes. We got a bunch of questions uh, about how, what do you think space advocates can do better to effectively communicate with elected officials who are already not in favor of space activity? Thank you, thank you for that question. Uh, I spent many years grappling with that very point. What I came to learn is that the space, by the way, I forgive what sounds like a cheap plug, but recently I published a book titled Space Chronicles, Facing the Ultimate Frontier. The original title of that book, submitted to the publisher, which they nixed, claiming it was too depressing. The original title was Failure to Launch, The Dreams and Delusions of Space Enthusiasts. Here's what everybody's doing wrong. 
They think that non-space people will feel exactly the way we do about space. We, as we, we assume that they, they're going to look up, oh, that's, I want to do that. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's in our DNA. Oh, we are explorers. We are American. There's a whole list of arguments given. Do it for the spinoffs. And we do. Oh, wait, every dollar in space is spent here on Earth. These arguments are tired. Not only are they tired, they work for us. But if you want to step out of this community, you need a different kind of argument. You need to compel the nation to value space exploration on a level so deep that it transcends the winds of political discourse. In just the same way, veterans' benefits is not on the table in a presidential debate because we mandate that that's important. You don't even debate that. So you get into the culture the value of what it is to explore, not only psycho-emotionally, but economically, because there's a percentage of the public that doesn't care about this psycho-emotion. They care that they have a healthy economy. It's the economy, stupid. That's the phrase. And so the transition is NASA as a handout to NASA as an investment. And when you think of it as an investment, it's cheap. You do it because the discoveries of NASA will lead that exercise in just the same way as I earlier asserted in your annual reports. You lead with your space missions because you know it's cool. Plus, typically, they're not classified, so you get to talk about it <laughs> on the cover. So, so what do you do? I, I'd like to believe that I've assembled some messages that have leaked out of our, our community and have resonated with others. The opening chapter of that book was excerpted for Foreign Affairs magazine. I don't know how many scientists ever got something in Foreign Affairs magazine. That got into Foreign Affairs magazine. And for, I would later learn, because I'd never even read Foreign Affairs magazine, that I have nothing against it, it's just not my journal, right? I would later learn that that lands in the lap of every member of Congress, and it was two days after that landed in their lap that I got the invitation to testify in front of the Senate. Had it only been the book, that invitation surely would not have come. It's just another space book, as far as that would be concerned. So, the geopolitical implications, the, the economic implications, got me interviews on, like, on, on, on business, business news. Because we're, we're in a doldrum in our economy, people are looking for anything that could help. And so, my suggestion is, you talk about ways that space matters to people who actually don't care about space. Then it becomes deeper into people's motives. And the economy is number one, by far. And, the, and, and you get there, it, by the way, it's not just A goes to B. The A goes to B is need better kids, get better science teachers. That's A to B thinking. Some solutions take a few steps. A to B to C to D. You double NASA's budget, you innovate, you, there's a call for all the scientists and engineers and technologists. They then become these fields. Patents are awarded, industries are created, the economy booms. That takes a little longer than an elevator ride to explain. Now I'm from New York, our elevator rides are a little longer. I could do that in a New York elevator ride, not in Rayburn office building, okay? So yes, it's a challenge. But if we don't rise to it, we will regress back into the cave because that's where we're headed as the rest of the world passes us by. Next question. <laughs> Sorry. That was great. <laughs> Next question. So we got about uh, 15 minutes left. There was a, a number you could text questions to. You, you talked about this a little bit. Your rationale is obviously uh, passionately about the inspiration and emotional power of exploration. Do you think for some that's sufficient? It's not su it is not sufficient to write the check. And so Columbus was an explorer. Queen Isabella, no. She wrote the check. By the way, there was some private monies mixed in with those public monies, but basically it was a mission of the state. 
Columbus was an explorer, but when Queen Isabella said, Columbus, Queen Isabella didn't say, oh, Columbus, go explore and come back and tell us all the things that you found and draw pictures of the flowers and of the natives there and, and give lectures on, on these discoveries. No, she said, here's a satchel full of flags of Spain. Wherever you land, declare the land in the name of Spain, find a shorter route to the Far East so that we can trade more efficiently there were geopolitical and economic drivers behind that, even if, even though Columbus himself was an explorer. I submit to you that we can talk exploration as a pure urge forever. But at the end of the day, the checks get written for different reasons. And the history of the world bears that out persistently. T bằng 0 nè. Ly độ nó ở ngay vị trí X bằng cộng A nè. Được chưa? Và nó đi về vị trí cân bằng. Tức là nó đi theo chiều âm đó các bạn Đúng chưa? Nó dao động đi xuống Đúng không ạ? Nó đi về vị trí cân bằng Được chưa? Như vậy nó đang chuyển động theo chiều âm nha <cười> Các bạn chú ý điều đó cho thầy Rồi chúng ta chưa tính cot phi dựa vào công thức x0 chị e Vân vân chỗ này thầy đã nói rồi Đó là cách số 1 Cách số 1 theo thầy nghĩ cách này không hay Các bạn Muốn tính phi chúng ta dựa vào ngay đường tròn lượng giác luôn đó các bạn Đây chúng ta rành đường tròn lượng giác Tại vì trong dao động điều hòa à, Có mối quan hệ mật thiết với đường tròn Với chuyển động tròn đều nha Đúng không ạ? Trên lớp trong sách giáo khoa người ta đã trình bày Thầy cô trên lớp dạy các bạn Thì thầy tin chắc rằng người ta cũng đã dạy cho các bạn rồi Đúng không? Trên lớp thầy cũng vậy thôi Thầy rất chú trọng về cái đường tròn lượng giác này Thầy cũng hướng dẫn học sinh Hướng dẫn các bạn học sinh lớp 12 rất là nhiều về cái đường tròn lượng giác này. Và đường tròn lượng giác này sẽ theo suốt quá trình của chúng ta hầu như là hết hết học kỳ 1 luôn của lớp 12 luôn đó các bạn. Được chưa? Rồi. Lớp 12 năm năm cũ nha. Năm nay là thuộc chương trình lớp 11 năm mới rồi. Thì năm nay lớp 11 thì nó sẽ đẩy người ta sẽ bổ dục người ta sẽ đưa ra cái chương dao động điều hòa nè, chương sóng nè. Đúng không ạ? Đây là hai chương mà nó nằm ở trong chương trình vật lý lớp 12 của sách cũ. Được chưa? Các bạn lưu ý điều đó nha. Rồi, bây giờ thầy cho chúng ta sẽ cùng đi tiếp tục. Như vậy, chúng ta muốn tìm pha ban đầu, chúng ta sẽ dựa vào điều kiện ban đầu. Đây, các bạn coi nè. Ví dụ như một vật dao động điều hòa, chuyển động xung quanh cái vị trí ô này. Đây là pin dương của chúng ta. Đây là pin âm của chúng ta. 